All right, welcome everyone. I'm your track host for this session. Uh, my name is Pushkar. We have Chip and Brand who are going to talk to us about path to production, sustainable compliance in strict environments. Chip, Brian, take it away. Hello everyone, thanks for being here. This is our session, Path to Production, Sustainable Compliance in Strict Environments. My name is Chip Zoller. I am a technical product manager at Dermata and also a Caverno maintainer. Hey everyone, my name is Brian Keller. Um, I'm a software engineer at Defense Unicorns and kind of our talk today is to kind of walk through some design patterns around, you know, how can we create sustainable compliance in these um, regulated environments. And really regulated is called out here because it's more of an extreme case, but as we look to commercial environments, as we, as we look to just general our dev environments, we want to be thinking about, okay, who does this impact? Um, why does it impact? Should I be looking at specific things about my data, et cetera? Um, so we're going to kind of walk through a couple things. Um, stick with us to the end. We're going to have a, a demo to kind of walk through some automation that'll be a little bit more exciting. Um, but we definitely have to set the stage, right? Um, a regulated environment, um, what is it? Uh, typically, if you think about that, your, your healthcare, financial, government, uh, et cetera. Um, some of these environments that we're building, Kubernetes uh, on various cloud providers, they need to meet compliance with a certain set of standards, um, i.e. Your, your NIST 853s, et cetera. Um, and we've been doing it for a while now. It's, it, you know, it's working for us, but how can we start to push into, you know, what's, what's the best path forward? How can we automate compliance as a part of how we're delivering software to these environments? Um, and so there's, a, there's definitely a lot of things that go into that. Um, the uh, like optimal scenario that we're talking about here with regulated environments is we want to know um, absolutely to the most granular layer, like what is being introduced into our environment. Um, and I think that's very important. I think we're, if we're thinking about Kubernetes in particular, we're definitely at the cross section of GitOps with declarative configuration. Um, it's going to be pretty explicit about hey, this is what I'm changing. I'm, I'm making the change in somewhere that w requires approvals and reviews in order for it to then be introduced into the environment. Um, and on top of that, or maybe as a layer below that, we can think about um, like what other systems come into play with compliance. Um, so if we're, if we're doing the, the best case scenario for GitOps, um, then below that, right, is it's introduced to the environment um, and things are running as they should. Um, but what about uh, at the, you know, access control to, to that cluster? We want to really prevent this cluster from drifting from that configuration. And so we prevent like manual modifications as much as possible, right? We're restricting access for who has the ability to go and touch any of that infrastructure, uh, but also having tooling in place, i.e. like policy enforcement tools um, that can restrict certain actions from ever being conducted against the cluster. Um, and so that kind of sets the stage for like what a regulated environment is. Um, one of the, the big key pieces I think of sustainability in compliance is um, trying to get away from this not invented here syndrome. Um, when we think about even commercial environments, we think about enterprise environments, government, et cetera, um, and, and Kubernetes, we're, we're all leveraging similar stacks of products that are providing this common baseline. We all need logging in our cluster. We all need ability to monitor what is going on there. We all need ability to enforce policy within that. And uh, these are very important, but um, what we don't need to do is we don't need to go and write all of our own orchestration and tooling uh, around that, right? We, we can leverage open source, many of us, that's the very reason we're here. Um, to go and really provide a lot of value, we can say, like, who has the, the most uh, intimate knowledge of the logging stack? Well, probably the maintainers of that logging stack. They can tell us all about the decisions they made and the capabilities it provides. Um, and we can, we can leverage those ecosystems. Um, and, like, probably for the greater portion of the last decade, um, we've been hearing a lot of things come out, DevOps, DevSecOps, um, and we really want to 
they mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people and we really want to start to get into how can we collaborate on solving some of these problems. Um, kind of an instance of this that we see kind of within the government space um, would be platform one um, and kind of that big bang Kubernetes baseline for compliance with the DevSecOps reference design from the DOD, Department of Defense. Um, I call this out because again, it's, it's a baseline, it's open source and available for people to pull from that starts to think about how do I integrate my logging stacks with my service mesh. And this is done elsewhere, it's not only done here, but it, it's worth calling out that we're, I mean, we need to collaborate on these things in order to provide like the best capability, uh, the most secure that it can be. And you know, this is ultimately a, a, a common denominator across all of industry, healthcare, et cetera, these regulated environments. Um, and so as we delve into that, we, we reach the word reciprocity. Uh, bear with me if you're on the compliance side of the house because I can feel eyes rolling in the back of your head. Um, but really we kind of have to redefine this, right? Um, I originally want to say like reciprocity needs to die, um, but I kind of started thinking about it some more and it's really, you know, reciprocity, this idea of we're gonna, we're gonna practice the exchanging of things for mutual benefit and how can this apply to us? How can this apply to DevSecOps? How can this apply to regulated or unregulated environments, your dev environments, et cetera? Um, and so kind of as a, a precursor to that, like CNCF, we're, we're building applications. They're, they're cloud native by design. They're, they're meant to be scalable. They're meant to be extensible and configurable. Um, but what happens when you have all of those things to, to meet the one node cluster or the 1,000 node cluster is that largely um, there's a lot of ability for those, even if it's the same application, there's a lot of ability for that to be different from the small to the large, the, you know, the single to the scaled. And so if we start to look at some of these things, how can we think about you know, what information is really pertinent for compliance? And that's where I think like reciprocity needs to be involved here um, to get away from the historical thinking of I, I've, I've met my tests for compliance, received my you know, stamp for the next year that says I'm good um, and no one's gonna check it in between then. Um, and here's why, here's why I'm secure and get away from that and kind of move towards the like the how. How am I secure? How can I reproducibly, you know, ingest any piece of software in the open source um, or proprietary, et cetera? And when I have that, how can I go and validate that it meets compliance with controls? And um, this is really a space where we, we wanna kind of like key in and target. Um, that's gonna be largely important and so I think this kind of falls into two, two bins of, of different um, you know, styles of work. One is compliance as code. Uh, if you've been in compliance work before, if you've had to run through NIST 853, um, those standards are there for a reason. And you know, they're providing a lot of guidance and a lot of direction for how to secure systems. Um, but at the same time, if you run a check and you get your stamp and then that ultimately sits in a document and doesn't go anywhere, doesn't do anything, doesn't evolve, then it's not, it's not a living, breathing document anymore. And you're gonna have to redo all that work again the next year. Um, and so there's this you know, concept that we're really pushing towards compliance as code. Um, we, we no longer want the Excel spreadsheets and the Word documents, et cetera, where you're checking the boxes for yes, we met AC3, uh, but instead you're documenting in code in something that can be version controlled because we know the goodness of version control um, and, and what that brings to us for the ability to audit and non-repudiation, et cetera, um, that we can, we can really leverage the goodness in that. And I'm gonna show an example here in a second of what that looks like. Um, but it, it gets back into, you know, these are things that we can continually evaluate. We can make a change in the code base for a tool and we can then immediately say, you know, as, a, as an approval review process, is this changing my compliance controls? Is this changing what can be um, satisfied as part of that? Um, and so kind of as a uh, general overview here, I'm just gonna show a quick example. Don't read into it too heavily. I, I get that it's a lot of text that you have to parse through. Um, but the, the general concept here, right, is 
uh, for any given control, if we talk about any given tool, um, for instance, we're looking at service mesh from Istio, um, and if we want to start classifying that, hey, if I use Istio as my service mesh, what controls may be satisfied as part of that with this universe of controls? Um, we can start to say, okay, well, from 853, we can, this control, AC3, is, is satisfied under these conditions. Um, that's all great information. It's a, a lot of good direction that we want to push towards for what it, what can be satisfied. Um, and we can also, you know, move, scale that into multiple sets of different standards that a tool might be compliant with, what, whatever is most applicable to your environment um, and most important to you, and, and then start to classify this preferably with the upstream um, in such a way that it's controlled there. Um, those who have the most in-depth knowledge of the tool can provide a lot of background for what is going on under the hood. Um, but one thing to note here is that this is the universe of controls. These are things that can be satisfied by the tool. Um, and ultimately, that's what we've been doing with our checkboxes. We've been doing some checks under the hood uh, for, yes, this meets this because of this. Awesome, I got that documented and available. Um, but it doesn't live, it doesn't allow us to build stacks that um, can be, you know, inherently aggregated. If I want to deploy Istio and my logging tools and my monitoring tools, each one of those should have these documents kind of um, living in their code bases such that I can point at them, I can aggregate all of them, and then within, uh, you know, seconds, I can say, here's the full list of universe of controls. Let's go and, let's go and validate that somehow. Um, we're gonna demo that here at the end, that we're gonna actually start to actionably automate that process um, and start to work out how can, what does automation here look like? Who is involved? Um, it's certainly not an end all be all right now. We're not done with it, it's not solved. Um, compliance is largely an ever changing space, but uh, definitely worth consideration. And so if you've got, you know, as Brant showed, you've got the definition of what compliance standard that you're trying to meet, and you've got that as code, the next thing that you need is policy, which is kind of the glue that binds the controls to the actual configurations. So your compliance is gonna be met by the tools that you're using and their configuration. Well, you have policy that can cover those things and perform validation on the tools. And if those tools change, then you have a set of policies that's for those tools. So policy can really be the glue that binds the controls that you need to specify in the compliance to the compliance stocks through their configurations. But the good thing is that we already have policy as code. If we can have compliance as code, we can marry that with the existing policy as code through one or multiple policy engines and store those things together or maybe separately, tightly couple or loosely couple those things together and be able to meet an entire compliance standard with code. And so in this demo, we're using Caverno, which is an open source policy engine built specifically for Kubernetes. It's an incubation project, maybe you've heard of it. Uh, but using Caverno, you can validate these configurations that satisfy the controls and also do things like ensuring software supply chain security. So whatever images that are being, that are associated with those, you can do things like verify that they have signatures. If they're attested, and hopefully we get to the point where more of us are at least doing image signing verification, doing attestation verification, you can also ensure through policy with the same engine that these images have been attested to and that even the contents of the attestations are whatever we expect. And with Caverna, which is nice uh, to be able to sort of get everyone on the same page with compliance, there's no programming language that's required. So not only is that easier for you, but it's also easier for your auditors, and maybe you want that, maybe you don't want that, but you, your auditors are at least on the same page, and everybody can read a simple YAML definition without having to parse maybe even an esoteric programming language to understand, all right, here's how we're meeting compliance. You can clearly see the definition that's here. It's fairly straightforward. 
And you know, because we have policy as code, you can version control those policies as part of that compliance. So you keep your compliance as code, you have your policies that map to it as code, everything's good. And you're able to use your existing tools to then modify and manipulate those policies. So things like namespace exclusions, like if you're deploying these tools in a Kubernetes environment, you're often gonna have some form of exclusion I need to exclude based on namespace, maybe based on label. Obviously, you know, you, your organization, maybe your auditors need to get involved to try and understand that. But if everything is as code, it's a simple readable YAML definition and makes it super simple to not only parse that, but also to programmatically manipulate that with your own tools. And uh, the other nice thing, and, and indeed a necessary thing, is we need to be able to check these things throughout the delivery process. So not just ensuring compliance is running in the cluster, we obviously all need that, but we wanna make sure that the start of the pipeline, the entry, all the way throughout, that these things that are, could be introduced remain compliant. And with the use of like the Caverno CLI, this is a perfect match in pipelines because now you can ensure that your manifest that you're about to introduce through that PR, that they remain compliant to your compliance standard mapped all the way down to the policies. And you can have all of these things as code. So some of the things in the future that, you know, if we're successful in doing this and we, if we get enough traction that the world where we'd like to kind of get to is the ability for auditors to sign these policies. So one of the neat features that's in Caverno 1.8, which was released earlier this week, or at least the announcement was, you can YAML sign your policies, or you can YAML sign the definitions that are coming through your pipeline. And if any tampering has occurred in that, the signature will fail validation. Not only will it not get pulled, but it won't get run. And that's in addition to the image signing verification. But also, you know, we've got this OSCAL definition that defines the compliance standard that we want. And we have a set of tools we should be able to decouple the compliance from the set of tools from the engine. So these things are all loosely related but decoupled so that you can have different policy engines and your set of tools that you want. Each tool maps to a set of policies and all of this is stored in version control as code. Everything from your compliance to your tools themselves to the policies to your engines and all of that's bound together. All right, and kind of setting the stage for the demo. Um, so what we have, what we've talked about, right, is we have these OSCAL documents. Um, they're machine readable. Um, and so as such, we can start to build automation that naturally, organically facilitates reading that information and taking some actionable steps for how do I, how do I take the, the state of, I have the universe of controls that we've been talking about and find out what is actually satisfied given the configuration of my environment, of the way that I've deployed the tools, of how I've configured them. Um, and this is really important. So if we, we take that OSCAL document and then we start to um, run it through automation, produce reports also in OSCAL so that all of our you know, GRC governance risk compliance tools can uh, read them with following the NIST standard for OSCAL um, in the schemas. Uh, we can really get to a state where I've deployed a tool, I've checked um, that um, these controls are satisfied as part of my deployment of that tool, and I've uh, immediately um, made that available for the GRC tool to visualize. And this can be a very continuous, very event-driven process. Um, I'm going to show a, a CLI-driven version of it, but um, it could be something that's continuous. We can get to continuous compliance in the form of any change that's introduced into my environment. I want to rerun checks against what's applicable. I want to rebuild my entire SSP um, for what is automatable um, and make that visualized for whoever the persona is that needs to see that information. If it's our authorizing official that needs to say, yes, you're still in compliance, they should be able to go to th that service, that GRC tool, that visualization, anytime and see th the real-time compliance of that environment. We're getting away from these checks where you know auditors came in, they did the check and said, it's good, I'll see you in a year. Um, and at any point in time, not only can we visualize it, but also the OSCAL compliance and the um, documents that are being generated about what is satisfied is still the how. We've translated the how from 
um, the tool makers, the open source, the upstream proprietary, whoever. Um, we've transferred that to those who are operating the environment, and ultimately that gets has the ability to be transferred on to anybody who audits. So if we want to, again, have third parties um, looking at the environment and validate it, then that is a, a, an absolute option and it should be reinforced. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to try a live demo, you know, wish me luck, um, but um, really around the idea that uh, on the bottom there, very small text, apologies, you're gonna see I've got a live Kubernetes cluster running on my machine. Uh, it's gonna represent my environment um, and what I'm, I'm gonna be looking at is I'm gonna look to introduce a workload that I'm gonna say um, does this, uh, the state of my um, application, this, this workload, does it meet compliance with a control? We're gonna, we're gonna run through validating that scene, pass fail scenarios, um, and what that means. Um, and, and then from there, start to kind of run through um, that full end-to-end that full -end process. Um, so uh, I'm gonna start kicking off, you should see on the top here. Uh, I'm gonna do it as we go. Um, I've got my, uh, you know, air gap delivery tool, Zarf, to kind of help me with this process because I'm uh, not gonna rely on Wi-Fi, so I'm gonna have everything I need locally and be able to um, deploy applications to this cluster without the need of internet and Wi-Fi. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna look at um, is and this should be coming up here, is that OSCAL component definition, this OSCAL file, right, that we wanna say we want to ingest. Um, and so there's, again, you're gonna see a lot of things here for what this looks like. We're gonna use Istio as an example, um, and there's a lot of data in OSCAL. Bear with me. Um, I'll point out like what's immediately um, the most important is really when we get to um, these implemented requirements, we're pulling from uh, 853, uh, as you can kind of see there in the center. Um, and out of that, we're gonna look at, okay, for the, the given state of my environment, can I go and validate that some control is, is being satisfied? Um, today, we're gonna kind of look around the idea of AC4 and high level, you know, how do systems uh, within my environment communicate with one another um, for the service mesh? Uh, people who are familiar with service mesh, really we wanna get to sidecar injected environments for the state, we're not using ambient here um, at the moment, but if, if we can go and validate certain things, like is the sidecar injected, we can start to really hone in on, yes, you know, workloads are going to use MTLS to talk to each other, um, and that way we can really, you know, dive into how do our systems communicate with one, other, one another, and are they um, compliant? So there's a lot of descriptive information that Tetrate has done with the produ production of this, um, which is awesome. We wanna know um, from those who are most familiar with the applications, um, how to go and validate that a control uh, has been satisfied. But what I'm gonna point out here is kind of this rule section. And this is something that we're um, working on uh, with NIST for OSCAL, is creating fields that we can go and automate. We can evaluate with automation and then we can go and prove out, yes, this can be satisfied and let's go run the check. Is it satisfied? Is the control satisfied by the environment? Um, and so we've got uh, kind of a, a field here. Those who are familiar with Kiverno, we're leveraging Kiverno engine under the hood um, to provide us with validation of kind of what that environment looks like. Um, so let's kick it off. We got our Kubernetes clusters on the bottom there. Um, what I'm gonna do is I've got a Zarf package. I wish I could explain more about Zarf. Sorry for my Zarf friends. Um, but I'm gonna deploy a package. It's all um, local to my machine in this uh, package uh, compressed tarball. And I'm just gonna say, we're gonna confirm it. And then I'm going to set a label here really quick for true. And this is gonna say, uh, yes, I want injection on this application um, for this package that I'm deploying. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna kick off um, the deployment of this workload. And so you should see that introduced there. Um, and as such, it, you're, what you're gonna notice about that is we can 
um, see that there are, there's some common um, things we can point out really quickly. Two of two, um, I hope. I can barely see this from my <laughs> vantage point. Um, but uh, the, the general idea is we're going to be checking to see if this thing is compliant with the control that we are looking to automatic, that automatically validate with automation. Um, and so it's deployed, and we have an OSCAL um, definition that we can ingest with our tool, Lula, um, to go and then do um, an evaluation. Is this in the correct state? Um, and so what we'll perform next is um, a, a Lula execute, and this is going to ingest that document and then go and perform a, a live check against our live cluster to see if it's in the right state. Um, so if we if we do that, what you're going to notice here immediately, it's going to go and apply kind of a policy-based check uh, against this environment. You're going to see things like, hey, resources passing one. There was only one pod there to really go and validate against um, for this control to have been met. It's a very um, high-level um, check of this control, not by any means completely fleshed out for what does meeting AC4 across your full environment look like, but we want to demonstrate this capability. Um, and so it's passing, wonderful. What this does in the interim is um, generate um, a compliance report. Looks like I have a couple here. Um, and so, let's see, 12. Um, and so just kind of generic pass information. What was it that passed so that we can then feed this into GRC tooling? Um, we've worked with um, kind of partners in the past to integrate different pieces together to really get to the continuous compliance framework. Um, and so there's information here that's pertinent to that. Um, but let, let's change it. Let's make it invalid. Um, so with our, our Zarf deployment here, let's purposefully remove the injection of the sidecar um, from the service mesh so that it, it couldn't communicate with anything else in the service mesh. Um, via MTLS, and so we will run that, and it's going to start deploying uh, a new workload, start terminating the old, um, and now our, our updated version, we've, we've changed something, are we still compliant um, with the, the given control that we said we were? Um, and so it's, it's simply a let me remove these real quick. And then um, it's simply a rerun of that loop, that OSCAL definition for what is meant to be compliant. Uh, we're not telling Lula that anything has changed. We're, we're, we're just going to be an auditor perspective and go and validate that that is the case. Um, so we'll execute and kind of as expected, um, super exciting. It is now saying it's failing, um, right? And so this is. Uh, this is where we want to get to. We're, we're doing these checks against live environments. We can do these checks with static manifests as well. And really, we're, we're looking at how do we um, help NIST evolve OSCAL? How do we, as an ecosystem, open source, assist with that? And then how do we start producing OSCAL um, models that are really going to facilitate the end users and operators of the environment? Everything from conducting assessments. Um, so if we take a look at that compliance report, it's going to be telling you it's failing. Um, and that'll be, that can be made immediately ingestible by GRC tools. Um, and yeah, that kind of covers um, what we're looking at currently, wanting to extend this outside of Kubernetes. Um, but there's definitely a, a breadth of, breadth and depth of, you know, discovery that still needs to be done in the compliance space. How does OSCAL need to evolve? How does Lula? and other compliance engines need to evolve um, to really get to a point where we can start to cut out, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of hours worth of repeatable compliance processes that are being done every day, everywhere, in every regulated environment, um, and get to a better path forward. Um, so with that, um, any questions? And I'll come right to where you are. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Have you guys seen any uh, resistance to moving away from the rubber stamp yearly audit? Um, I'm just going through an event with my CSO team who don't want to approve pull requests. Any guidance for me? Other than sell? <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. Um, there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of variables involved there. I think like, if we get to you know, these frameworks where we're, we're actively iterating on like, how, do, how do we prove out the provenance of these queries, right? If, if you looked at the high-level version of what we saw today, it's, it's not every single check that needs to be performed. That, we need to write that query. We need to iterate on queries like those. And in your instance of, you know, resistance to change, resistance to, you know, what's being introduced, et cetera, like, it's going to be very tough. Uh, but I think that the, the common denominators here are, like, we, we ultimately want to, to get things changed and updated and maintained because vulnerabilities and kind of the risk that comes with not changing. Um, but how can we automate out some of these processes? Maybe compliance with certain controls is a path forward for, you know, proving out that something should be changed. Like, it is your pipeline, you know, go and check, like, hey, if I introduce this change, is it going to violate a control? Is it, or is it going to introduce something new? Is it going to introduce a new control? that I am now compliant with because I've ingested that. And I think there's a lot of possibility here to kind of leverage that um, to, I really wish I had a polite way to say this, to help cyber with, you know, coming into the, the, the DevOps, the DevSecOps pipeline perspective. Not that they aren't, not that there aren't people that are, but um, these definitely have to be very cohesive teams. Cheers. So it, it looked like, from what you presented, that, um, that Istio, like upstream, provided that list of controls that, that could be satisfied by Istio, and then you've got the policy to, to check that. Can you just comment on what different people, in order to make this a reality in terms of actually pushing all the way forward to like a, an authority to operate or something like that, what would the different responsibilities have to be? What would have to happen from different organizations? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, Really, it's, it's leveraging kind of all of these open source communities to, to start providing some, some baseline. And again, open source, what's good about that is if you're, if you're very passionate about um, compliance, maybe you're contributing it to an op upstream source. Uh, but the idea is like have this live as close to the source as possible. Um, again, so that those who are well versed in an application um, can be able to evaluate those controls and look at them and say yes, no, like here's our, here's, here's our list for this release. Um, but once you have that in place, right, then all the consumers of that can start to, if, if it lives up in the upstream or if it's something that you have to inject in your system, I think there's a lot of work to be done here. But um, at the same time, um, let's, let's start to get it to a point to where it can be aggregated. And really, if we're thinking about the personas, like the, the one AOs are authorizing officials um, in, in what information they need, but also the operators, like they're the ones building these environments, they're the ones that are going to have to change things on the fly and or, you know, like largely um, react to something that is no longer compliant and fix it. Um, and so, like, I, I see multiple layers here of having the, the document, the universe controls available starting to build out your environments or update and maintain your environments and ingesting the results of that, those compliance checks and making them available in visualization. Um, kind of uh, some other things involved there with your question I'm probably not hinting at right away, but absolutely relevant. All right, we have time for one more question. Okay, we'll go here. Hey, good afternoon. Um, I'm thinking about the relationship with the compliance department. How did you guys streamline that relationship so that they trusted that your policies satisfied their phone books full of rules? <laughs> Valid question. Um, I, I would not make the claim that it is 100% validated by whoever sure. is, is going to be doing this, right? And we're talking about 
tools such as Lula, they're, they're not tied to 853. They're meant to be agnostic of the standards that we can, you know, do other things like SOX and PCI, et cetera. Um, and given that, um, there's still a, a large amount of work that still has to be done here and a larger amount of validation that still has to occur. And I think what's gonna play hand in hand here with concepts we're well versed in or becoming well versed in is kind of like supply chain security and the idea of like provenance and attestation absolutely applies here. And getting things like having auditors signing policy, having auditors sign you know, compliance definitions for when something is met is kind of a collaborative activity yet to take place. I'm hopeful that it can take place. Yeah. Um, but we need automation tooling to kind of look at this compliance space and, you know, start to, to work with one another to build out something that somebody would want to put their signature and stamp on. Yeah. I don't think we're there yet. Okay. Um, but I think we can get there. Yeah, cool. Thank you. And something else that's going to help is reliability. Like knowing that when you say or claim, not that it's going to alleviate auditors' concerns, if your environment is compliant, that when somebody else checks independently, that the two line up. Because one of the historical problems is we are compliant. We tell you that we're compliant. Look, look at our tool. It says we're compliant. And they come in. It's like, all right, there's 40% deviation. No, you're not. So it, that's one thing. The other thing is putting control back in the people's hands who need to have control. And that's a, that's a question of trust. And some of the things that can help with that are tools like signing and validation of a lot of different things so that they can have the control, you can run it, the results are consistent, and everybody's on the same page. All right, that is time. Thank you very much for attending, and thank you to our speakers. Thanks, everybody, for coming.